Hello, I'm Ryan Sungali, and I'm joined today by Howie Hawkins, uh, presidential candidate for the Green Party, who has emerged as the party's frontrunner for the 2020 nomination. You were also a co-founder of the Green Party. Um, I want to ask, uh, you know, you've been involved for many years as an anti-war, anti-nuclear and pro-worker activist. I, I see the Teamster shirt that you're wearing right there. Um, you worked for UPS as a time, so you are, you are understand the working man. Um, can you speak to how your experiences have colored your worldview and led you to get involved in the taxing process of running for office? Well, I, you know, I worked construction before I was a teamster and I got involved, you know, I started working full time right when wages peaked, you know, 1973, since then wages have been stagnant. In fact, the average hourly wage now is a dollar less than it was in 1973, which is not what I expected. You know, I went to college, but I didn't want to sit behind a desk writing memos. I like construction. And, uh, you know, I expect my, you know, wages would come up with productivity and they didn't. So I know what, you know, working class folks have been going through. In fact, you know, working class life expectancies are now in decline which is unheard of in developed countries except for Russia when they collapsed in the 90s when the Soviet Union fell apart. So, you know, we got a real problem here and I, you know, I think I got a feel for that. Mm -hmm. I want I want to also ask you about uh, ballot access. That's a, a big issue right now because in uh, 2016 the Green Party had ballot access, I believe in in 47 states. Uh, currently, right now, I believe that number is at 22, and in pe in person petitioning has been halted uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, how is the uh, Green Party um, approaching that uh, and making sure that uh, the party can get on the ballot uh, in as many states as possible? Yeah, we're up to 24, and this okay. is about where we are every election cycle because most of the petitions are due in the summer. And because it's unreasonable to expect people to go out and do physical petitioning, we've been appealing to state governments. In states where we've been on the ballot many election cycles, we say, just put us on. Vermont did that. Illinois refused. We took them to court, and they did it. Uh, another state, New Jersey, is allowing electronic signatures. Uh, we have legal processes underway in a lot of states. In the case of Alaska, uh, they haven't really shut down and they are saying you got to do a physical petition. So we just committed $10,000 to pay petitioners up there to get the signatures required. So they're out there with masks, gloves, disinfectant for the pens and, and getting the signatures. So it varies from state to state. But our goal is to be on all 51 ballots, 50 states in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, now, the Green Party has historically been uh, the most progressive uh, party, uh, major party, um, you know, major third party in, uh, in America. Uh, what are the issues that you're hoping to uh, bring to the voters and, and make part of the national conversation? Well, I'm leading with three issues that are life or death issues. One is the climate crisis, which we are calling for an eco-socialist Green New Deal which is a plan to get us to zero to negative carbon emissions and 100% clean energy by 2030, because that's what the climate scientists' carbon budgets say rich countries like the United States have to do if we're going to avoid the worst calamities from climate change. And within that Green New Deal is an economic bill of rights, and that deals with the second life or death issue, which is inequality. I mentioned working class life expectancies declining. This economic bill of rights is designed to end poverty and economic despair. So it includes the right to a job at a living wage, mm -hmm. uh, income mm -hmm. above poverty, affordable mm -hmm. housing, comprehensive health care, lifelong public education from pre-K through college, and a secure retirement. And then the third life or death issue is this new nuclear arms race. We're modernizing our nuclear forces. The strategic nukes are now hypersonic, six times faster than before. So there's no longer 20 minutes to launch on warning to check out if the warning is a false alarm or for real. Uh, we're putting more tactical nukes into conventional forces with the crazy idea that we can escalate to de-escalate, which won't happen because once the nukes start flying, it's automated. They'll all fly and we're over. So we're calling for nuclear disarmament initiatives, cutting the military budget 75 percent, beginning to withdraw from our over 800 foreign military bases, seven shooting wars over hundred countries where we do special operations, pledge no first use of nuclear weapons, disarm to a minimum credible deterrent, and then go to the nuclear powers and say, we want complete 
and mutual global nuclear disarmament. And behind that is a treaty that 122 nations agreed to the text to in July of 2017, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. And hardly anybody in this country knows it. So one objective of our, of our campaign is to put that issue and make it a top campaign issue. So those are you know, the three leading issues. Of course, there's scores of issues and we can talk about it. We could talk about it for hours. Um, you know, this is a, an unusual time. I, mean, I feel like every election season is an unusual time for America, but this particularly because of the pandemic, you know, unemployment is skyrocketing. Um, there's no guarantee that uh, some of the jobs that have disappeared are going to come back, even when, um, you know, businesses are safe to open up again. If you're the president, uh, how would you uh, uh, approach this situation to pull America out of this um, current um, calamity and, and uh, restore um, some semblance of uh, security, financial security uh, for uh, American families? Well, the, the House convened the day to look at another coronavirus package, and I've laid out 11 points, including Medicare coverage for coronavirus treatment as well as testing and other emergency health care services, uh, 2000 per adult and $500 per child per month for the duration moratorium on evictions, foreclosures, utility shutoffs, uh, cancel those payments from the household level, have the federal government pay those to those who would receive it, credit unions, community land trusts, banks, landlords. So those businesses stay in business. So we're ready to reopen when we can. Right now, small businesses who employ half the people in the country, most of them didn't have enough cash reserves to last a month. They're going out of business now, so you're right. So we got to do a lot of things immediately, as well as provide the testing, contact tracing, and isolating of infected people uh, before we can go back out safely. But in <clears throat> the long term, <clears throat> we're going to be in a depressed economy because investors are scared. They don't want to take the risk to invest in new productive assets or loan to small businesses to get them back on their feet. Consumers are getting hammered, so they're going to hold on to their money. They're not going to go out and spend it loosely. So we're going to have low demand, low investment, a depression. That's where the Eco-Socialist Green New Deal comes in. I mean, the budget that I've developed, people can look at it on my website, HowieHawkins.us, is a $27 trillion program over 10 years to transform our, our economy for 100% clean energy and negative or zero to negative carbon emissions. And that would employ 38 million people. The uh, most extensive assessment of how much unemployment we have right now is 43 million. That's the National Jobs for All Coalition, which includes uh, part-time workers looking for full-time, uh, discouraged workers, um, as well as people that are not recorded, but are looking for work, are not recorded in the official statistics. So that's how we're gonna get America back to work and get out of this coronavirus depression. If we just uh, leave it to the market and you know, investors and consumers, it's going to take a long time. And a lot of people are going to be devastated economically. Mm -hmm. What is your message to those who say, look, you know, I, I voted for Bernie. I'm closer to the Green Party than I am to Joe Biden, who is the presumptive de Democratic nominee, I think, at this point. Uh, but I need to do harm reduction and get rid of Trump. Why is it, in your words, in their best interest to vote for you instead of supporting Biden? A vote for Biden is a wasted vote if you're a Bernie Sanders supporter. You supported Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, uh, an economic bill of rights, student and medical debt relief. If you want those things, I mean, Biden has said he would veto Medicare for all if it crossed his desk as president. The, he, he's not for the Green New Deal. His, he had the worst of the climate action programs of any Democrat running and so forth. So if you vote for Biden as a Sanders progressive or socialist, you get lost in the sauce. They don't know that your vote is for those things. You're for Biden. You vote for the Green Party, it's real clear what you stand for. And then you've made your statement and the politicians have to deal with it. They can't take you for granted. So I say, you know, don't waste your vote. Make it count. Vote for what you want. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I saw that you put out a, um, a graphic that said that Joe Biden is Bernie Sanders' plan B, you know. Um, and I think it said something along the lines of, you know, what's your plan B? I think, was that the verbiage? I think it was Sanders. Yes. Biden is Sanders plan B. What's your plan B? And mm -hmm. I guess there was a picture of me or something. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, no, I think I'm playing B for the Sanders supporters if they're serious about what they were supporting Bernie Sanders for. Joe mm-hmm. Biden's opposed to all those things. It's clear. Mm-hmm. You know, Trump is totally incompetent in this crisis, but Biden is invisible. And, you know, I like to say it, just take the climate issue. Trump calls climate change a hoax, but the Democrats act as if it's a hoax, particularly Biden. You know, there are no solutions coming from them. He is totally pro-war. You know, he's he, he supports trying to overthrow the government of Venezuela as much as Trump does. You know, there's no real alternative in that issue. So, you know, we're not going to get what we want unless we vote for what we want. Mm-hmm. I want to, uh, you know, stay, staying on the topic of Bernie, uh, you know, I want to ask you and it is voters. Uh, what do you say to young voters who got into electoral politics in 2016 because, you know, they, they heard Bernie's message and they got excited about it? Um, and they supported him twice. They went out of their way to volunteer and donate to his campaign, but are now disheartened, you know, to see Biden become the presumptive nominee after winning primaries in states where he didn't even have much of a volunteer base um, and are now thinking of giving up on electoral politics. What is your message to keep them engaged? Well, the mistake was thinking the Democratic Party would let you, you know, get what you were campaigning for. Uh, the Green Party is a vehicle where you can continue that fight. You know, don't get discouraged. Don't get sad or mad. Get even, you know, and support the Green Party and continue to fight for those issues. And Bernie Sanders demonstrated that they have widespread support. So let's, you know, keep the movement going. Mm-hmm. You know, um, some, some may look at electoral politics as, you know, solely about wins and losses. And, um, you know, but the Green Party, uh, you know, can earn official minor party uh, designation from the FEC if uh, the party gets over 5 percent of the popular vote, you know, which would then qualify the party for federal funding. Um, can you explain to viewers why it's important for those looking for a viable third party option, um, how important it is for the Green Party to get over 5 percent? It's a a good benchmark. It does give us the status of official minor party in the FEC uh, categories. You're a minor party from 5% to 25%, then you're a major party. And that qualifies you for federal funding for the general election in 2024. But we're qualifying, and I'm the only campaign that is, for federal primary matching funds this year. And we need to raise $5,000 in 20 states in contributions from individuals of $250 or less. And we're now at 13 states and we're closing in very quickly on all 20. So we can get public funding now. But in the long run, you know, whatever the FEC definitions are, what's going to build the Green Party into a major party and force in American politics is to elect thousands of Greens to local office and local districts of state legislatures and Congress as we go into the 2020s and build this thing from the bottom up. When we have a caucus of Greens in Congress, then our presidential ticket, nobody will be able to ignore it. Mm -hmm. So what we can do with the presidential race is in about 40 of the states, the vote we get for president determines whether the Green Party has a ballot line for the next election cycle. It's usually one, two or 3%. New Mexico's half a percent, Alabama's 20%. That's pretty hard. But, uh, with those ballot lines, it's much easier easier for us to run those local candidates. So that's a win right there for us. I take a, a question from a uh, someone that uh, recommended for me. Um, they wanted to ask, uh, it's from Russell Shepard, um, how can we shift the climate conversation away from consumer blaming to hold major polluters accountable? And do you see a city or country that is doing a good job of this? Uh, on the consumer versus, you know, who's producing, uh, we got to give them the facts. I mean, if every consumer, you know, adopted the most uh, carbon reducing lifestyle, it would only have an impact in single digits of our carbon production because the way the production systems are laid out, the transportation systems, you can't avoid using carbon fuel. So those are just the facts. And so we got to, you know, tell people the facts. Um, we also got to tell them that We're not asking you to become poorer. In fact, in an eco-socialist economy, you will have a choice and we would have a choice to end planned obsolescence. So we're not producing stuff that wears out soon and then ends up in in, waste dumps. We, We could increase our wealth by having more durable products, even though 
the gross domestic product, which is measured by how much we buy and sell, would decline. So these are things that we need to be educating on. And uh, I think that's that's the best approach. Blaming the consumer or telling them they got to be poor in order to save the environment is not going to persuade people. And in fact, they don't have to be poor. We can provide everybody's basic needs within ecological limits. And the things we got to cut back on are the technologies that uh, consume the environment and throw pollution, including carbon, out into the atmosphere and the land and the water. Um, aside from the possibility of a significant electoral upset um, and getting to 5%, can you tell us how the Green Party can define victory in 2020? Well, we get more ballot lines. Uh, we get whatever vote we get is the vote we have for leverage going forward. I ran for governor in 2014, got 5% of the vote. When Governor Cuomo wanted to run up the vote to get ready to run for president, he wanted more than his father ever got, Mario Cuomo. He wanted more than he got in 2010. He actually got less. And he looked over and here were the Greens with 5% of the vote. He couldn't take us for granted anymore. He had to adopt some things he'd never supported that we were demanding in order to compete for our voters. And that included a ban on fracking, a $15 minimum wage, and paid family leave. So <clears throat> the more votes we get, the more leverage we'll have. Um, but the ballot lines are, are one crucial thing. And I think injecting our issues into the national debate, the Green mm -hmm. New Deal, the Economic Bill of Rights, and an anti-militarist, anti-nuclear weapons program to build peace instead of more war. I think those are all issues that, uh, to the extent we get them raised and debated, uh, we're ahead and we'll come out stronger than we went in. Mm -hmm. So those are all advances we can make without actually getting elected to the White House. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, uh, on touching on the anti-war um, sentiment, you know, uh, Trump has, uh, since the pandemic has started, Trump has um, ramped up his anti-China uh, rhetoric. Uh, do you fear that um, this uh, rhetoric from Trump um, is accelerating um, the country towards uh, a potential war against China? I think they're bluffing. They put more, you know, military assets off the coast of China. They just backed a mercenary effort to do a coup in Venezuela. The coronavirus, while everybody's looking at the coronavirus, they're doing some military things. Um, as crazy as Trump is, I don't think he wants a war with China, which will become nuclear. Uh, but this is, you know, brinksmanship. And it's dangerous. I mean, we should be engaging China on a climate issue, on a nuclear arms issue, and definitely this coronavirus. I mean, Trump has pitted all the states against each other, bidding up prices for medical supplies, no plan for testing, contact tracing, and quarantining. And he's pitting the nations of the world against each other. On Friday, he had our UN uh, representative block a resolution for a global ceasefire so we can focus on the pandemic. Um, so this is, you know, very dangerous. And, uh, counterproductive. We got to keep our eye on it. And, you know, the thing I'll say about Biden is he's he hasn't said a word about any of this because he supports regime change in Venezuela. And he wants to, you know, appear as hawkish as he's always been a hawk. So he's not going to criticize us for opposing a global ceasefire. So when it comes to war and peace, there really is no difference between the Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I could just ask a couple questions about just to so people can understand who a little bit more about who you are as a person. Uh, I saw that you had a background in sports uh, growing up. Uh, uh, do you have a favorite uh, sports team or athlete? Well, Willie Mays was always my hero um, from the 50s. I mean, I saw him in 58. I was six years old in Seal Stadium. That's before Candlestick. It's the old San Francisco Steels minor league stadium. Um, yeah, the Giants. The A's, they moved to Oakland, the 49ers, and then the uh, Raiders, and of course the Warriors. After a long drought, now they're winning championships. So, yeah, I came up in the San Francisco Bay Area, so those are my teams. Mm -hmm. And also, I saw that you had a, a photo of yourself uh, on Muhammad Ali's body when uh, you uh, beat Twitter on the um, the issue. I think where Twitter was trying to uh, to block you or ban you. Um, do you have a favorite boxer? I didn't even know that. You know, I got people in my campaign doing that. <laughs> but yeah, Muhammad Ali. I mean, I had a Swedish grandpa who 
always told me, you know, you should grow up like him. He can really talk well. And uh, so, you know, he's been, a, you know, popular in my family. Uh, I also liked Archie Moore. Uh, he lasted a long time. And I actually know some guys on the west side of Chicago that <laughs> they went into his boxing gym and they were really kind of gangbangers and they wanted to learn all the dirty tricks and fighting. And Archie Moore would teach them and then get them out of the gym because they weren't serious about boxing. But um, I always liked him. And uh, I got I, I actually boxed Willie Pep, who was this little guy. He's a 50s, maybe 40s fighter. And 1940, uh, yeah, Willow West. Yeah, I got uh, I got recruited to the Stanford coaching camp, you know, for young athletes. And uh, I was supposed to box this one kid, and I was swinging wildly. I wanted to knock him out. I didn't like him. And he stopped the fight, and he said, try to hit me. And he just bobbled well, me. You cut off for a second. What, 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 was you, what were you saying about uh, about boxing Willie, uh, Willie Pep? Oh, well, I was trying to knock out this kid that I didn't like, and – I was swinging hard. I think he didn't want anybody to get hurt. So he said, try to knock, try to hit me. And he was bobbing and weaving. I, I couldn't hit him. It was like trying to punch a fly. So that's as close as I ever got to real boxing. Oh, wow. And uh, also about, um, you know, do you have a favorite movie? Oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of person I have a hard time sitting still watching a movie. Um so I'm not much of a moviegoer. I'm trying to think. I mean, I've, there's some documentaries I've watched over the years. Um, I, I can't really tell you. Or how about like a, a documentary or a TV show? You know what keeps coming to mind is The Last Resort, which is a film about us occupying the nuclear power plant at Seabrook. And The Last Resort was we did civil disobedience after fighting it in other ways. And, uh, you know, I, that's sentimental to me because I was involved in that. So, you know, that's what comes to mind. Mm -hmm. and, and, and last question before I let you go, um, you know, because I got to ask you about the pandemic. Uh, uh, voting, um, it, it may be uh, unsafe uh, later in the year to even go to the polls. Are you concerned about that? How do you uh, plan to um, get voters to um uh, you know, mail-in ballots. Um, how do you plan to uh, turn out uh, the voter base uh, for 2020 uh, during this unusual time? Well, I'm calling for mail-in ballots, universal mail-in ballots. This coronavirus package they've just started working on in the House has got to include that, and everybody should be demanding that, because otherwise we're going to have low turnout. Uh, I don't expect this pandemic to be anywhere near over. Uh, there's a lot of misconception out there. We don't know if you have long-term immunity once you've had it. So the you could get reinfected. Vaccines, the fastest we ever developed one was four years for the mumps. These are coronaviruses. That family includes the four common colds, SARS and MERS. And there's never been a vaccine for a coronavirus. Um, and then antivirals um, are really not that effective a lot of times for these viruses. So you know, we're not even sure we have a good treatment. So I think in November, we're still going to be in the middle of this. And if we don't have mail-in ballots, a lot of people aren't going to want to go out and, you know, risk their health if they don't have to. Uh, so I'm very concerned about that. So, you know, the immediate thing is to get Congress. The, the, the number I've heard is $4 billion will be needed, and it needs to happen now so the states are prepared to mail them out and then count them when they come in. So that needs to happen right now. Well, well, I greatly appreciate you, uh, Howie Hawkins, for taking the time to speak with me, a uh, uh, Green Party uh, candidate for uh, 2020 uh, president. Thank you very much. Thank you.